the common thought that the environment and the army are at odds is totally false. The army and the environment are absolutely one. You just heard from Wolf Amaker, former command sergeant major of the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg, who helped exploring North Carolina examine this question. Is there an inherent conflict between military training and environmental protection? I'm in a magnificent longleaf pine forest, and the banded tree beside me is home to the endangered red cockaded woodpecker. Around me in the forest are magnificent wildflowers. So where is this paradise? I'm at Fort Bragg, one of the world's great military training facilities and one of the nation's greatest conservation stories. That's our story today on Exploring North Carolina. Fort Bragg, in perfect harmony. What comes to mind when you think about Fort Bragg? the sprawling 165,000-acre base in the North Carolina Sand Hills, with its 57,000 military personnel, including the 82nd Airborne Division. Left side, move forward! Right side, move forward! Certainly you think about realistic training for many of the world's most elite soldiers rugged conditioning, rapid deployment, and of course, a sky filled with parachutes, day and night. It comes as a surprise to many that this fabled facility had to deal with a difficult internal struggle over 20 years ago, one that put a small woodpecker on everybody's radar screen. Mike Lynch, Director of Planning, Training, Mobilization and Security at Fort Bragg begins our story. When the problem first really materialized was in 1990, 1991, when we had a, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service came in and did a consultation with us, and the result of that consultation uh, was a je what we call a Jeopardy opinion, wherein the Fish and Wildlife Service determined that the training at Fort Bragg jeopardized the continued existence of the red cockaded woodpecker, which at the time was a federally protected endangered species here at Fort Bragg. That little three or five word sentence changed the entire way we conducted training and the way we thought about training at Fort Bragg. And although we, we admit it, it started what we call from conflict to collaboration, it was a big conflict at, at the first, at the front end. This conflict is understandable when you examine the intense focus of military professionals on training. When you were charged with being responsible for training soldiers who are sons and daughters, of you know, the people of this great nation, you take that very seriously. The one thing that the Army has is a moral obligation to make sure that our soldiers receive the best training they can because there's a direct correlation between the training reality that they receive and combat survivability. We know that the better trained they are, the more likely they are to come home. So from us, from our perspective, it is a sacred oath that we have to maintain. And so that's the way we approach it, and it was very confrontational, it was very emotional at the time. Just how difficult was this conflict to resolve? Well, clearly some might think that we were a little, little archaic, thinking that we were the United States Army and we had a mission to train soldiers, and by God, we'd just come back from two wars, Panama and Saudi Arabia, and we're victorious. And we just need to get on with doing what we need to get done. Uh, 
the other side of the house kind of thought, hey, I'm a federal enforcement agency and I'm here to tell you, bud, we're gonna do, we're gonna do things a little bit different. So it was very confrontational. In fact, quite frankly, when we first started this, we couldn't sit in the same room for more than an hour without having to take a break. It was just, it was that much passion. We were passionate about being able to train soldiers. The Fish and Wildlife Service, the Environmental Defense Fund, conservation groups were passionate about protecting the environment. Uh, and although over time we really realized that it wasn't training that had, had jeopardized the species, it had been fire management practice and growth and development that had choked out the forest and, and taken away land. So Fort Bragg ended up being an island. It was a, the last remaining bastion for many species. I asked Mike Lynch if there was an aha moment when the competing sides in this dispute came together. I, th I think if I had, with, if it was an aha moment, we were, we were discussing with the, uh, the regional uh, scientific community, the, the endangered species community, about being able to do a movement contact. That is a pretty routine operation for, for the military. But it sounds pretty, it sounds pretty, pretty bad. We're gonna make a movement contact. So we were asking, you know, is there a way we can do this? And the answer was no, you can't do that. Uh, so he said, well, could you come up here and let us, we'll, we'll show you what it is. And so we brought the Fish and Wildlife Service, we brought people from academia here, and we got a unit out of the 82nd Airborne Division, and they went out and they did a movement contact, which is basically walking through the woods from point A to point B looking for the enemy. And once the, the biologists and, and, and the regulators realized, hey, a movement contact is just walking in the woods, it was all hot. That, that goes to, hey, we're not speaking the same language. We've got to figure out what, what all this stuff means. And so from that, from that point forward, we really, uh, we really uh, made progress. So what we, what we learned over time by investing time and money was that things like fire, constant fire from our bullets, from our bombing, from our training, burn through this environment that's a fire-based ecosystem. As it fire burns, it regenerates the growth. It is good for the environment. It is also very good for the soldiers. Areas like this that you have clear lines of visibility, you can travel, you can see, are far better areas for soldiers than areas that are choked out and you can't and you can't move. Okay, and oh by the way, that's exactly what species need. Whether it be woodpeckers or sparrows or snails. Mike Lynch said that fire in the forest is good for soldiers. So we also asked Wolf Amaker, the former command sergeant major of the 82nd Airborne Division and now chief of operations of range control at Fort Bragg, if well-maintained fire-based ecosystems aid training. Non-commissioned officers focus on training. That is their job. They do the training in the Army. So in order to train an Army, you need vast amounts of space. Uh, so we, as non-commissioned officers, are focused on taking care of the environment because that is our space. Land is a very finite resource. We know that. Once we're out of it, we don't have any more of it. So we have to do a good job taking care of what we do have. At one time, there was a joke going around that said the red cockaded woodpecker was the only enemy the 82nd Airborne Division couldn't beat. Uh, but in fact, it became a training partner to us because the red cockaded woodpecker, once we learned how to live and train with it, it became sort of an indicator at Fort Bragg of how we were doing overall in the environment. If the red cockaded woodpecker was doing well, that meant we were taking care of the rest of the environment as well, and it was being beneficial. So the more we took care of the red cockaded woodpecker and became uh, almost symbiotic with it, then the more we took care of the land we trained on and the more beneficial it was to us. I told you this was a story of conflict, but you would never guess it now. When you tour Fort Bragg with a small cadre of environmental professionals, who know the needs of the red cockaded woodpecker and longleaf pine ecosystems, but also the needs of today's soldiers. My guides included Jackie Britcher, the award-winning Endangered Species Branch Chief at Fort Bragg, Brian Ball, an endangered species biologist who oversees the research on a butterfly, the St. Francis Seder, found only at Fort Bragg, and Kevin Crawford, a wildlife biologist and a second generation land manager at Fort Bragg. 
but it was Janet Gray, an endangered species botanist and program manager for rare plants, who described for me a much more complex Fort Bragg than I remember as a young trainee over 40 years ago. So within the longleaf pine wiregrass ecosystem, you see the pine canopy, but in the ground cover, there is a diversity of wildflowers. And late spring and fall, they are terrific wildflower shows, bursting with color. And we have approximately 1,200 native plant species that occur on Fort Bragg. And of these 1,200, 42 are listed as rare by the state of North Carolina. And they're all longleaf pine affiliates maintained by fire. In past episodes of Exploring North Carolina, we told you about the many natural communities found in this state. The same is true for Fort Bragg. Within the longleaf pine wiregrass ecosystem, there are a diversity, a high number, variety of native habitats that are here. We have 23 natural communities from wetlands, streamhead pocosins, sandhill seeps, blackwater coastal plain small stream swamp, xeric pine hill scrub, pine scrub oak sandhill, a diversity of communities that are contained within longleaf pine wiregrass. By far, the most common natural community is the pine, scrub oak, sandhill community. But Janet describes some rarer communities where much of Fort Bragg's great diversity resides. What's so special about Fort Bragg? There are two community types here that are so rare, seldom seen anywhere else in the southeast, and that's cane breaks and sandhill seeps. And cane breaks are areas that are characterized by cane, arundinaria, tecta, and they form these expansive ribbons of green throughout the landscape. Um, due to fire suppression, most of cane breaks have disappeared across the southeast, but are here in fairly good frequency on Fort Bragg. The St. Francis Seder also finds its home in cane breaks particularly within our impact areas where our most extensive cane breaks occur. Another rare community type are sandhill seeps, and they border coastal plains, small stream swamps, and streamhead pocosins, and they support a diversity of herbaceous species, including lots of rare uh, plant species, and they need frequent fire to maintain their openness. These wet areas are also home to some of North Carolina's most famous species, our carnivorous plants. There are a number of carnivorous plants on Fort Bragg. We have pitcher plants, we have sundews, butterworts, utricularias, but the most famous is the Venus flytrap. We're the westernmost range for this plant and we have 42 locations on Fort Bragg. The Endangered Species Program is only a portion of the Environmental Sustainability Plan in place at Fort Bragg. Mike Lynch explains. We do a tremendous amount of sustainability. It all goes back to what we learned in the woodpecker, taking care of our environment, taking care of our soldiers. As I said before, our, our one sacred trust is we have to be able to provide a, a good, solid, realistic training for our soldiers. We also have to provide a place for them to live, okay? and it has to be a place that they can enjoy, that has a good quality of life because it keeps them in the service, keeps their family in the service. So we do have great services and facilities, and we look at how can you embed new technology, green technology, sustainability to make them more efficient so they last longer, cost less money so we have more money to train our soldiers and sustain this place for the next 150, 200 years. I'm sitting in a wild green place surrounded by plants normally found on rocky outcrops. But I'm on the roof of a building at Fort Bragg, a lead platinum building. I had a chance to talk sustainability with Dave Hines, chief of the environmental division at Fort Bragg's directorate of public works. This building is built to the uh, leadership 
energy and environmental design standards lead. And it has, uh, has several features that, that make it a platinum facility. One of those is the green roof, which uh, minimizes the amount of runoff from storms that uh, would, would contaminate the environment. And then also on the, uh, another feature of the building are the uh, skylights, which maximize the natural lighting into the work areas, into the, into the building, and minimize the use of energy. Dave explained that green roofs are only part of Fort Bragg's commitment to the environment of its soldiers. Fort Bragg has an a extensive sustainability program. We take great efforts to minimize the impacts on the environment by taking it a step farther. Dave showed exploring North Carolina facilities with solar panels and modern, high-rise, energy-efficient Army housing surrounded by native plants. Remember, this show started with internal conflict over training needs versus a small woodpecker. My, how things have changed. There were times very early on that I remember we couldn't even hover a helicopter over a red cockaded woodpecker area. Uh, and it became sort of taboo to even move through that area. Now, uh, we teach, every week I teach a course uh, to the soldiers that train on Fort Bragg about the requirements for them to train here the safety requirements and things like that. But half of that uh, is how to live with the environment and how to take care of our training lands. Because if we don't teach the soldiers below us, then they won't be able to take care of the environment for the people that follow them. Uh, so after all those years of what we thought was going to be harsh uh, restrictions, we found out that they were just in effect uh, causing us to help ourselves maintain the land. Lost in all this is a fact not known to many of us. The red cockaded woodpecker is regarded as an umbrella species because it chooses to excavate holes in living longleaf pine trees, providing homes for numerous other species, including owls, bluebirds, and fox squirrels. I ask if soldiers now come under the umbrella of the red cockaded woodpecker in longleaf pine forest. And is Fort Bragg now a better base than before the woodpecker conflict? Fort Bragg is a far better training base today than it's ever been. Yeah. A lot of that has to do with the physical environment, how the landscape is managed and how it's taken care of. And it, and a, it is a very expensive proposition. It requires a lot of manpower and a lot of hours and a lot of dollars. But to manage this for endangered species and manage it for soldiers is something we have to do. So from that perspective, the benefits to the land from being burned, from being managed, from having the forest thins, make the land, the geographic area, far better to train in. You know, the, the biggest thing that I think I, I would want, and not just I, but that the Army and that soldiers would want to get out uh, to everybody is that the common thought that the environment and the army are at odds is totally false. The army and the environment are absolutely one. Um, the United States Army must have large open spaces to train in. Uh, we can't do that because God's not making any more land. What we've got is what we've got. Like I said, we're almost symbiotic with the uh, with the red cockaded woodpecker. When we're taking care of that particular species, we are not only taking care of all the other species that fall under it, but ourselves as well. In hearing the many voices at Fort Bragg tell this story of conflict, cooperation, and ultimate success, you may have asked the question, why? Why is it important to live in concert with our natural surroundings? Our friends had answers. To maintain the environment for endangered species is exactly the same as maintaining good training lands for realistic military training. Both require that the environment be maintained in such a way as to perpetuate not only endangered species, but for movement through the terrain for the, for the military. Sometimes the why 
we don't know is the very reason why we should care and preserve those species. You would not want to get rid of something that you haven't yet fully realized the value of. And so you keep all of the parts of the system because they all work together in concert, in unison. And to not know an upfront economic value or benefit, or if it's not readily apparent, then it's just a good reason to keep that piece of the puzzle. If I were to tell somebody why it's important to uh, provide funds for endangered species, I would say because they are just indicators of how the rest of the world and landscape is doing. So if you have species that are not surviving, then you're not taking care of the lands and they won't be there for our future. If I were to say anything to anyone, is that protecting your environment is protecting your own stake uh, in your business. Uh, it, it, it's an important part of that and it's a huge part of the United States Army. I believe the one great takeaway that you can use in any setting, whether it be corporate or local government or municipality or even private business, is the ability to, to find win-win situations with partners. To be able to find partners that have a mutual interest that you can leverage your resources to do something good, whether that be a business venture, to improve your community, to improve the quality of life, a good example is, as part of this environmental stewardship road we've taken, we created a 20-some-odd mile trail along the, the boundary of the installation. From the installation's perspective, it's a boundary, it defines our property, but it really wasn't used for much. Taking that and turning it into a nature trail that you can learn, you can teach your children, you can teach the community about various species, conduct, you know, go out and do hikes and, and picnics and things like that creates a good sense of environment, a good sense of community, also opens opportunities for economics, such as ecotourism, rental of equipment, biking, you know, hiking to equipment. So there, there are things that you can leverage if you just look for you know, what, are, what are the possibilities and how do you find that win-win. This win-win attitude with partners, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Environmental Defense Fund, the Nature Conservancy, and the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program have made Fort Bragg and North Carolina better places. So much so that many of the conservation lessons learned here have been implemented at other military installations across this country. We all owe a debt to the men and women of the American military for helping to preserve our way of life. But we also owe them a debt of gratitude for preserving the best of our natural landscape. And we learned this while exploring North Carolina.